We're going to talk about batch visualization on Compute Canada clusters. So I'm Alex Razumov. I'm a visualization and training coordinator with Westgrid. And I typically handle a lot of visualization um, tickets, well, visualization tickets and visualization uh, requests, so helping in various projects. If you need any help with uh, scientific visualization uh, related to your research, uh, let me know, and my job is to help you. So the uh, zip file with today's presentation is linked um, at the bottom of each slide. You can see there's a bit.ly link. So it says 2MLO and, and so on. And uh, if you type that in your web browser, it will download a zip file. And you unpack it, you'll find, among other things, the PDF of the slides. Uh, so batch visualization, we'll be talking mostly about uh, remote batch visualization on clusters. And uh, I assume that you have a data set sitting somewhere on a cluster, whether it's a simulation data set or we have some experimental data, but basically have a large data set and you want to visualize this. And you do have quite a lot of options. So these are the four orthogonal options I'd like to highlight. You can, uh, if the data set is not too large, you can simply download it to your laptop and visualize it locally. You can do remote visualization. You can do uh, visualization via a GUI client, things like Paraview, visit uh, VMD, a few others. They give you a nice client where you load the data set via menus and then you interact with it in real time. Or you can script it with a, a batch script. You can uh, do rendering visualization on a CPU or on a GPU or a bunch of CPUs or a bunch of GPUs. And you can do it so in serial and obviously in parallel. Uh, so you have at least these 16 options. So all of this you can do uh, locally on your laptop, for example, using multiple cores on your laptop on the cluster. So as you can see, you have a lot of options. Uh, plus, of course, the choice of tools, et cetera, et cetera. And today we're going to talk mostly about uh, remote CPU-based uh, visualization. Uh, so I'm going to show you some examples. Uh, and uh, also uh, another common scenario is uh, GUI interactive client-server visualization, and I'm going to show you that too. Uh, so why do you want to do remote visualization? Well, obviously, when your data set is too large, like the uh, data set for um, our competition this year, uh, one terabyte, obviously, you cannot download and visualize it on your laptop, so you have to do remote visualization. If you try to visualize a very large data set, it will not fit into your uh, memory, physical memory on your laptop or your desktop, and so you have to do uh, remote visualization. Also, you'll have limited uh, power, limited uh, CPU and GPU power. And an added benefit of remote visualization is that if you do it in parallel using multiple cores in a cluster, and if you're reading a data set and using a tool that uh, can do parallel IO, parallel, uh, parallel uh, reading from the same file uh, by multiple processes, uh, your data set will be read much faster than if you try to do it serially. So that's another big benefit of remote parallel uh, visualization. Then there are uh, special uh, use cases uh, like in situ visualization and using commercial software. So I'm not going to talk about this today a lot. And what is batch rendering? So for the purpose of this talk, uh, batch rendering is a non-GUI uh, visualization. So you're not using GUI client. You're not interacting with uh, with uh, you know menus, uh, pressing buttons, etc. You're doing everything, typing either commands in an in interactive shell, or you write a script and then you uh, run the script from uh, from a Unix shell. And of course, there are many benefits to scripting. You usually use scripting if you want to automate uh, any repetitive or long tasks. So, for example, if uh, you script a visualization of a single frame. Uh, of a movie, then you can simply wrap that code into a loop. And then at the beginning of each loop, you read a new uh, file, a new uh, time step. And then at the end, you uh, write a new, let's say, PNG image. And then using third party tool, you merge these images into a movie and then have a beautiful visualization. So scripting is also great for uh, documenting your workflow. You simply uh, write a script and then you can run it uh, any time, uh, you know, a few years down the road, you can pass it to somebody else, you can share. So it's basically reproducible um, workflow. And of course, if you want to do any large scale visualization on a cluster, especially using multiple cores and using uh, batch queues, uh, then it's really, really a good idea to uh, script your workflow so you can actually do it in the background. So submit a visualization job in the evening, come back the next morning, and you have a beautiful movie at the end. Uh, so you can do batch rendering with uh, many different tools. So essentially, any Linux tool 
uh, that has a programming interface, whether it's in compiled or a scripted language. Uh, can, uh, so that visualization can be uh, scripted on a cluster. So here are some examples. So things like uh, the usual popular plotting uh, routines in Python, Matplotlib, Plotly, Boker. So all of these are Python libraries. And of course, you can uh, run visualization scripts uh, using these libraries on, on, on the clusters as well. Uh, YT Python library for uh, multidimensional, three-dimensional uh, volumetric rendering. So I'm going to show you some examples uh, of that as well. It's a Python library, so that means that you basically uh, script it and then you run it and you have a nice visualization at the end. So there are uh, multiple uh, domain-specific visualization packages. I can give you many examples, but one of the most popular one is uh, VMD stands for Visual Molecular Dynamics. And uh, among uh, several interfaces, you'll find a Python uh, scripting interface. So that means you can actually script your entire VMD visualization workflow in, in Python on a cluster. And then there are general purpose tools, you know, things like VDK, uh, Visualization Toolkit Library, that's been around for almost 30 years, since 1991. And it's really fantastic, really powerful library uh, for, uh, for uh, scientific visualization, for rendering. Uh, for computer graphics, it has a C++ interface and Python interface as well, so you can actually uh, script it on cluster. So MyVI2, which is a general purpose uh, three-dimensional interactive uh, visualization package. Uh, so MyVI2 is not parallel, uh, unlike Paraview and Visit, uh, which are general purpose and which are parallel, so they can actually be run on multiple cores, visualizing very large data sets. So of these, uh, all these tools, I'm going to show you examples in uh, Matplotlib. Plotly, YT, uh, and then I'm going to talk in detail about, I'm going to show you some several demos in Paraview, and then very briefly about Visit, because Visit and Paraview I actually do very similar things in different ways, but we simply don't have time to show all the demos in both Paraview and Visit. Okay, so uh, we'll start with uh, simple things like Matplotly, Plotly, and YT. Uh, these are all Python libraries and uh, they are not installed by default on the clusters. Uh, so to, if you want to install them in your environment on a cluster, let's say Cedar, Gram, Beluga, Niagara, what you do is you simply uh, load the Python module that you want to use, for example, Python 3.7.4 in this case, and then you use the virtual environment command to start your own um, environment. You can call it anything you want. You can place it anywhere you want in your home or your scratch or wherever directories. In this case, I'm uh, initializing a virtual environment using Python 3.7 into a subdirectory called Astro in my home directory. And then I, so when I type virtual n followed by, uh, by, by the, the Slack and, 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 and this argument, what will happen is a virtual environment will install Python 3.7 into the Astro subdirectory in my home directory on, on let's say, Cedar cluster or Gram cluster. And then it will install a bunch of other tools. One of them is a PIP Python uh, uh, installer, uh, Python, Mac, uh, Python package manager. And then uh, you activate your environment and then you'll say PIP install uh, dash dash no index. Uh, so first of all, you, you want to probably want to upgrade people and then you install a package. So in this case, I'm installing NumPy, Matplotlib uh, visualization, well, plotting library, Plotly plotting library, and then uh, you can install YT as well. So YT requires Cython. So you need to install Cython first, then YT. And then if you want to use YT in parallel on the cluster, you want to also uh, install MPI for Pi. And then uh, that's all. So installation is done. And then anytime you log out and then uh, next time you log in into the cluster, if you want to use this environment, all you do is simply type source astro bin activate and it will load your environment. You start Python and then all these Python libraries are going to be available to you inside uh, the Python shell. So we're going to start with Matplotlib. Uh, I'm not going to teach you how to use Matplotlib. I'm just going to show you how to do it uh, assuming that you're already familiar with Matplotlib, how to uh, do it um, as, a, uh, as, a, as a script in, in the background without opening any windows. So the trick is really very simple and uh, uh, very few people actually know about it, but all you have to do is simply initialize a hard copy backend. So you have to, when you uh, load Matplotlib into your uh, Python shell or your Python script, in the next line, you have to tell uh, Matplotlib that you're going to use a hard copy backend. So you're going to uh, be writing into PNG or SVG, so that's vec uh, vec vector graphics, or PDF, or PostScript, or JPEG file. And uh, then uh, the, very, uh, the very last command in your script typically will be a command to write your uh, plot to uh, a file. 
So uh, any model clip uh, visualization uh, can be scripted in this way. So in the next slide, I'm going to show you an example. And then you have a script, uh, and you simply either run the script on the login node, assuming that you have a very small visualization. So you have some remote data, let's say on CD cluster, and then you visualize it on, uh, so you, you plot the data uh, running Matplotlib uh, from the shell on the login node. But if you have any large visualization or any large processing, please try to use a compute node, and it's really very straightforward uh, to do that. So here's an example. Here's a, a batch submission script where I am simply sourcing my Python environment and running the matplotlib.py uh, script uh, from, uh, from, the, uh, from the job. So I'm asking this case for five minutes, for 1,000 megabytes, so assuming it's a very small script. And then you probably need to uh, supply uh, the default allocation for your, well, the allocation for your account under which you want to run this job. And then you would type as batch followed by the job submission script um, uh, file name and is going to be submitted to the queue. So here's a script. Uh, the details of the script are really not important. It's just one of, you know, nice uh, uh, visualization or plotting scripts that I took from the Matplotlib gallery. And what it does, it simply plots a Delaunay tessellation. So I have these nice triangles and multiple colors. And the only two things that you modify in this script, as opposed to the usual uh, online uh, plotting, where you open a window, a window pops up uh, when you run Matplotlib, is you have to, as I, as I mentioned, enable the PNG backend. So for some reason, it's called ACK. But that this command MPL use ACK enables the PNG backend. And then you do your visualization as usual. And then at the very end, uh, end when you have your plot, you simply uh, type plot, say, figure into a PNG file. And then you have a nice file uh, by sitting on, let's say, the CDA file system. OK, so Matplotlib is not interactive in a sense that it's a, a Python library. You run it. It produces a visualization, but the visualization is a static image. So it could be a vector graphics, could be raster graphics, or even a movie. But it's not. It's a finished visualization product. So you cannot really interact with it once it's done. So on the other hand, think, uh, libraries like Plotly or Boca uh, attempt to do interactive visualization. So these are Python libraries, uh, Plotly and Boca, that uh, actually create a uh, they, 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 they're they built on top of uh, JavaScript and uh, D3.js. So uh, when you run them through Python, they actually create a HTML5 uh, web page with a JavaScript embedded and data embedded as well. And um, then when you load that web page into a browser, you'll get a nice interactive visualization where you can actually, you know, pre, uh, pre, um, pre-program certain interactions, like what happens when you click on a certain point, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so Plotly, I'm going to show you only the Plotly example. So Boca is fairly similar uh, in terms of uh, well, capabilities. So Plotly um, was written by, so there's a company, commercial company, actually Montreal-based company uh, that uh, wrote Plotly. And they actually provide interfaces for a number of languages. So one of them is Python. And it's open source. So the library itself, itself is open source. But of course, they have a paid here as well. So if you want to use their services or their dashboard, or if you want to store a lot of uh, um, plots on their service, then you, you, you have an option uh, to pay. But uh, the free tier, uh, the, the usual tier is free. And um, what it lets you do is you can either do interact, you can either do um, online visualization where data or plots will be um, saved under your account on their web page or you can work completely offline. So for clusters, I assume that you want to work offline. You simply uh, start the Plotly, well, import the Plotly uh, library into your Python uh, interface, and then you save an image uh, that will be, so it's, uh, sorry, an HTML page uh, that you can later download from, uh, from let's say, CD cluster to, uh, to your laptop. So here's an example. It's just one of the standard visualizations that I uh, copied from the Plotly tutorials. And there are two things here that are important. So first of all, you, uh, you have to make sure that you initialize offline plotting. So you see input plotly.offline as pi. That initializes the offline plotting interface. And then uh, you, when you see the, uh, the um, uh, HTML page, you have to so supply the file name. And you also, if you run the script on a cluster, you also want to make sure that you set auto open to force. Otherwise, what it will do, it will try to open this HTML page inside a web browser right on the cluster, and that will create problems because usually there is no uh, good default browser, and then uh, it will probably give you an error message. So just make sure that you set auto open to force, and then you will have a file. And I can actually show you what the file looks like. 
So uh, let me try to open it inside the web browser. Open uh, parametric.html. And um, I think there will be some delay when I show this through video. Hopefully, uh, you'll be able to see it. So it's loading. It's actually quite slow on my laptop as well because video, uh, video conferencing is taking a lot of uh, CPU power. But here I can see it on my screen. Hopefully, you can see it as well. And you can see it's an interactive plot that was created entirely from Python using Plotly. And the result is a nice, a nice you know, interactive visualization that you can plot with, uh, you can interact with in, in your web browser. So uh, another uh, example I'm going to show you is YT. Uh, YT is a very nice package for three-dimensional volumetric rendering. So if you have data on any type of mesh in 3D, then YT lets you do uh, three things. So it can, uh, lets you do slices through uh, slice plots through this 3D data set. Uh, projection plots, and also very fancy volumetric rendering. And in fact, uh, YT, so YT originated in astrophysics, but it's so powerful and it's so, volumetric renderings from YT are so beautiful that it's now used in, in many different disciplines. And if you're not familiar with YT, you want to see what it can do, I highly recommend either checking their website, that is a link here at the top. Or I also, a few months ago, I did a couple of uh, webinars on YT. And uh, those webinars, the recordings from them are available on the website that you can see linked from the bottom of this page. So uh, you can run YT on your laptop. You can run YT on, on, on the cluster. So as, as you saw in one of the previous slides, to install YT, you simply do, you simply say pip install uh, YT. And perhaps if you want a rendering, uh, sorry, if you want a parallel rendering, then you install MPI for Pi as well. And then here's the entire YT script that produces a nice visualization that I'm going to show you in the next slide. And then if you want to do it in parallel, uh, you'll need to enable uh, parallelism from YT. So you'll type the YT enable parallelism command. And then you save the script. In this case, you save this as file called nested.py. And then you submit a batch script to, uh, to the cluster, uh, where in this case, I'm asking for 12 hours for, uh, for CPU cores. So it's an MPI parallel task. They can run, it will use four cores either on one node or spread across several different nodes. I'm asking for uh, 3,800 megabytes of memory per, per node. And then uh, all the usual things. So uh, I simply say s run python nested.py to make sure that uh, this script is, is run in parallel, using, uh, in parallel using MPI parallelism. OK, and it creates a nice visualization. Actually, uh, I submit the, the, um, the last script, uh, job submission script as batch. Right? And then it runs in parallel and actually there's some benchmarking and you can see you get a speed up. So if you run it on a single core, you get roughly 1.5 frames per minute. And if you run it in parallel, you get roughly four frames per minute. So you have you know, 2.5 or so factor, factor speed up, which, which is not that bad. And then at the end, uh, what happens is you have, so in this script, you have uh, 900 frames. And then so it's generating 900 uh, PNG images. And then uh, on the clusters, uh, we have a command called ffmpeg. It's already loaded into the default module. You don't have to search for it. Just type ffmpeg. And then you can uh, pass some flags to it. So these will create, will take all this frame then for digits, so let's say uh, 0001.png and so on images. And then it will merge them into a nice movie called grids.mpeg4. And then because you're doing this in the cluster, you probably want to download it to your laptop and then you can watch this movie. So here's an example of the movie that I created using uh, that approach. So it took a few hours on, on CD cluster and uh, I put it on Vimeo. You can actually click on this link and it will play back on, on, your, uh, on your laptop. And then I'll, I'll have time to play it back on my machine as well, but I'm not sure how well it will show on your screens due to the, uh, well, due to the limited ba bandwidth of video. So on my screen is playing, is playing really, really nicely, very high resolution visualization. So this one was created in parallel using four cores on CETA and took a few hours. All right. So next, uh, we'll go to Paraview and Visit. Uh, so as you probably know, Paraview and Visit we are created for, uh, to visualize very large uh, data sets. So very large means you know, gigabytes, could be terabytes. And obviously, to visualize such large data sets, you have to do it in parallel. So both Paraview and Visit support, support MPI parallelism. They can run, they can scale up to thousands and tens of thousands of uh, CPU cores on a cluster. 
uh, but you can also uh, run Paraview and visit on, on your laptop. So there's a nice pre-compiled client, well, nice actually pre-compiled standalone Paraview and visit application that you can download on your laptop. It's multi-platform, so Linux, Mac, Windows. You can download pre-compiled or you can download the source of compiled yourself if you want. And then it works really, really well. It's huge, it has a huge number of um, visualization. Well, both of them have huge number of visualization features, have a scripting interface, very nice GUIs, understand very large number of uh, different um, uh, file formats, et cetera, et cetera. So for the purposes of, uh, well, for, for the demos in this uh, presentation, I'm just gonna use Paraview and then I'll have a couple of slides about visit. Uh, but the idea is the same in visit, so the same workflows. And also, so I'm going to show uh, some demos. I assume that you are already familiar with Paraview Basics. Uh, if not, then just watch what happened on the screen, and then you can go to Paraview Tutorials, and we'll actually have a lot of uh, Paraview <coughs> uh, training materials online as well. So, for example, this link, uh, bit.ly Paraview zip at the bottom, is a link to our full day uh, Paraview uh, workshop, where I go through all uh, all, uh, you know, the introduction to Paraview and then more advanced topics, et cetera, et cetera. So I see somebody uh, just logged in and we get video from you. Yep, thank you. So you muted yourself. Okay, so uh, Paraview, similar to visit, Paraview has uh, this multi-component uh, architecture where there is a data server that uh, takes, uh, that reads the input data and then is responsible for processing the data and applying various calculations, various filters to this data. There is a render server that is responsible for, well, visualization for rendering, actually creating the pixels uh, on uh, in, in your visualization. And there is a, the client, the GUI client with the menus and, you know, buttons, et cetera, et cetera. So all three of these can, in principle, run on three different machines and then you can um, connect them. Uh, so typically what you usually do is one of two things. You, um, you can run all three components uh, inside the same standalone Paraview application on your laptop, and then everything will be done locally. So data processing, rendering, and all GUI interaction will be done inside, inside the same application. Another common use is when you run a client on your laptop, and then you run the data and render service as a single PV server application on the cluster in parallel, and then you connect your client to the PV server, and then all heavy lifting will be done remotely by the cluster, and then all interactions happening in the laptop. So you have full impression that you're doing, you know, data processing render on a laptop, but it's actually uh, happening on much bigger machine in the background in parallel, which is really, really nice. Okay. So uh, remote visualization, if you have data on, uh, on, a, uh, on a remote cluster in Commute Canada, you actually have quite a few options uh, to visualize it. So I'm going to skip the first two because the, uh, well, the first one is obvious. If your data set is too large to download, then uh, this won't work. You just cannot download it to, to your laptop. So the second option is really not good. I know quite a lot of people use it, uh, so visualization via remote X11 forwarding, but it's really an antiquated way of uh, doing remote graphics because uh, that uses the interfaces and, and mechanisms that were developed in the mid 1980s, and then they don't really scale well to uh, well, today's heavy graphics. So I highly, highly discourage you from. Uh, using Excel and forwarding for things like uh, remote Paraview. Uh, much better approach is to use uh, Paraview, to run Paraview inside a remote VNC desktop. And if you go to our documentation pages and uh, search for VNC, you'll find many, well, detailed instructions on, on several different ways of doing that. Uh, so even a better approach than VNC and the approach that I much prefer to VNC is client server because as I mentioned, you run the client locally as opposed to a remote client and then all interactions, so all menus, all buttons, etc., is happening locally on your laptop and it's really fast and then you just have a data processing beyond some threshold that will be happening on, on the remote server. And then if you script your workflow, then you can actually run your visualization uh, completely remotely without any windows as, as a bash script. So what I'm going to show you today is uh, two demos. One is a demo for small scale visualization in which uh, we assume that the visualization is so small that you can actually debug it on your laptop and then we'll uh, write a script. Uh, we'll, so we'll create a, a script from, from the GUI using the uh, trace tool and then we'll copy the script to CD cluster and then we'll run it uh, interactively on, on the login node and then as a, as a badge job using, well, using as badge command. 
okay? So the data set I'm gonna use for this is a data set I, I created probably five years ago and I use it a lot. You might've seen if you attended my other visualization presentations, but I really like it because it's small and has a lot of, a lot of features in it. So it's this mathematical function that is discretize inside a unit cube. So X, Y, Z run from zero to one. And then it's discretized on a hundred uh, cube quotation mesh. So hundred by hundred by hundred mesh. Uh, million uh, points, mesh points, and there's a single variable, so a single precision. So that means that the entire file is close to four megabytes, right? So the file is not included into the zip download that is see, so they see again, the link for those of you who join lead, uh, the link with the slides is at the bottom of each slide. It's a link to a zip file where you find a PDF and you will find a bunch of scripts as well. I do not include that file. Uh, so the, uh, net, um, sorry, the, um, um, this data set, net CDF data set, inside this download because it's uh, it's four megabytes, it's it's fairly large. But what I do is I included the Python code to generate this data set. So you'll need to have a NetCDF library installed. And on a laptop, if you're using Conda, for example, that's fairly easy, just type Conda install NetCDF and you'll need NumPy as well. And then just uh, run the script. And if you cannot install NetCDF, if you don't wanna generate the data set yourself, you can actually find this data set in our standard full deep prior view um, uh, workshop materials uh, at the link at the bottom of the screen, okay? So I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go here to my shell and I'm gonna uh, generate the data set. So I'm gonna say Python generate sign envelope with pi data set that will take a few seconds. It's just a small Python script that uh, writes an NCDF file. Okay, done. And my recent command will just show the latest file that was modified in the current directory. So just, you see that it just created the right time step to the data set. It's close to four megabytes, as I mentioned. And then I'm gonna start a local standalone Paraview. So I'm gonna use Paraview 5.7, a release candidate three. So that's the most recent Paraview you can download these days. And uh, let me go back to the slides. And uh, this is what I'm gonna do. So I'm gonna uh, start the trace tool. So I'm gonna start recording inside Paraview. I'm gonna load the file uh, that I just generated, nested file into Paraview. I'm gonna switch to volume representation, edit the transfer function and switch to a different color map. And then I'm gonna save the screenshot as a PNG file and then I'll stop the trace tool and that will give me the Python script that I will save as a file and then I'll edit it and move it or copy it to the, uh, to, to the CD cluster. Okay, so back to my Paraview. I'm gonna open the sign envelope.nc file. So it's a net CDF. I'm gonna use the net CDF reader. I need to uncheck spherical coordinates. I'll hit apply. And it's taking longer because I'm running it in parallel to video conferencing. So I'm gonna to switch to volumetric view. Then spin it a little bit. So I actually see the three dimensional cube. And then I'm gonna, uh, so it's now colored by density. I'm gonna click on edit color map. And then I will only show the high density, high values. Okay, so I added actually not the color map, the transfer function. And then I'm gonna switch to a different color map. So it's, uh, let's see, it's not bright red, but uh, some other colors. So let's just see what options I have. So let's say we wanna do it in, I don't know, in yellow color. Okay, here we go. I think that's that's a nice visualization. Okay, so as you can see, I have a three-dimensional object, and then I'm going to save uh, this image. So I'm going to go to File, Save Screenshot, and then I'm going to save it locally. I'll just type I don't know test test .png. So I'm just going to save it as a PNG file. Oops, test .png, and I'm going to say OK. And it popped up another window that asks me for you know, image resolution, compression ratio, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it saved it. Let me uh, do recent command again. Yeah, so here is the 400 kilobyte image that was saved and I can actually open it. Oops, sorry, cast a PNG. Yep, here we go. And it works. So uh, I can also, so the script is, oh yes, I wanna save the script. So I'm gonna go to tools and then, oh, sorry, sorry about that. I completely forgot, I forgot to start the trace. So I should have done start trace and then do the visualization. 
and then uh, that would create the script. Actually, let me try to do it very quickly again. So yes, I want to discontinue. And then the first thing I want to do is go to tool start trace. And I'll just do things very quickly. So tool start trace, all properties. Okay. Then I'll open the data. Okay, uh, site envelope C file into the reader. It's not spherical coordinates. Hit apply and then uh, switch to volumetric view. Spin it a little bit. Then I'm going to edit the color map to show only high values. Okay, and I'm going to switch to a different color map, for example, this one. Close all these sub windows and then I'm going to say tools stop trace. And now that gives me the Python code behind this visualization. So as you can see, there's a lot of stuff in it. If I save it as a file, I can actually run it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually close it uh, because a lot of commands here, so I'm not going to save it because a lot of commands here are setting defaults and you can safely, well, safely, if you know how to do it, you can safely delete about 90% of these commands because they are just setting the default values that are going to be set anyway. But the important things uh, should be preserved. And what I did, I actually already uh, created a script for you and I included it into, uh, into uh, this file called volume1.py that is uh, inside, you can find inside the zip download. So as you can see, everything here is very simple. I load the uh, NetCDF data set and then I uh, create a rendering context. So basically I create render view um, context. Then I'm setting the camera view. So essentially the uh, position of the camera and the point is looking at. And then I'm switching to volumetric view. As you can see, I'm calling right density and I'm switching, I'm editing the transfer function. I'm switching to a different color map. And then I'm saving the file as uh, volume.png at this resolution. So that's all very, very, very small script. So let me uh, close preview. And then I'm going to show you how you can run the script from the uh, command line. So uh, you actually have a number of options. Uh, one of the simplest one is uh, to use pv bash command. So in my case, uh, pv bash is alias uh, to uh, to this pv bash command inside Paraview 5.7 on my laptop. But on Cedar cluster and other clusters, if uh, when you load the Paraview module, you will find pv bash command in your environment. So you don't have to look for it. And then what I do, I'll simply type pv bash volume1.png. It will actually run the script without opening any windows. So this, this is a uh, operating system warning that asks me if I allowed for incoming connections because it also starts the Paraview server. So I'll say allow, but it doesn't really matter. And uh, then uh, if I run recent, you can see that it actually created the new visualization with the current time step. And it's a new visualization that I can open that was created completely in batch mode, right? So here's my visualization that I just created with PV batch. Okay. So next, uh, I'm going to skip this part. Uh, so here you can actually, I'm going to talk about it very briefly, but I'm not going to uh, run it inside the demo. So here, uh, here are some things you can do uh, to interact with your visualization. So let's assume that you ran the script not inside, uh, not from the uh, Unix shell, but you run it from, from the GUI. And the way you do this, in Paraview, you click on View, Python shell that will open a uh, Python shell window inside your preview environment. And there you can either paste uh, the Python commands or you can uh, type them or you can simply click on run script, navigate to the script and they will actually load uh, your uh, Python script and run it uh, right away when you click uh, when you click on OK. And um, then inside uh, the same Python shell, you can keep typing commands. So if you type help get active camera, uh, that will uh, give you the uh, short description of uh, this function. So basically, it creates, uh, returns the active camera for the current view. And it's a Python object has, that has a number of attributes and a number of built-in methods or functions. And one of these methods is azimuth. And the way you use it, so you can actually bring help on type help inside the Python, previous Python shell, help get active camera dot azimuth, and we'll tell you exactly how to use it. All right, so it's a function. And what it does when you pass an argument to it, it simply spins your visualization by a certain 
amount, uh, the, um, uh, the argument is angle in degrees uh, about the vertical axis. Right? And this, you can actually script certain fractions like rotation, uh, uh, let's say around the vertical axis. So in this case, what I do is if I take my last script and I replace this save screenshot command by the following Python snippet. So I say camera is equal to get active camera, number of frames is a variable equal to 90. Then I simply uh, organize a loop from zero to 89. And then I, uh, at each little iteration, I spin my visualization by one degree around the vertical axis. Then I save the frames. So the frames are, uh, are numbered, uh, the file names uh, have the number in them. So from 0000 to 0089. And then uh, they're saved uh, using the same uh, save screenshot command, except that now you pass a different file name. And then when you run the script, it will actually create a bunch of it will create a bunch of uh, files. So let me run the script and show what it looks like. So here's the script. Okay. And then if I type pivot batch, and then it'll be saving into the local uh, directory. Yes. And then I'll say pivot batch volume to the pi. And as we'll see, it will again ask me, I can say deny or allow. In this case, it doesn't matter because I'm not using any remote component. And as you can see, it's running actually quite slow, but let's just wait for 90 iterations. So the frames are numbered from zero to 89. Okay, so it created 90. 90 images, uh, and then you can actually stitch this into a movie. And I think I already have a movie called Volume, let's say, uh, Volume, yes, Volume of MPEG 4. That is very nice visualization, very smooth uh, rendering that is, uh, that is actually very small. So if you look at the size of this file, this is really amazing. It's only 270 kilobytes. So that means you can actually uh, fit quite a few of these on a floppy, floppy drive from the early 1980s, which, which is really amazing. Uh, tells you something about the compression quality of, of FFmpeg command. Okay, so I ran it locally, and then if you want to run it remotely, well, you just simply copy the data set and the script, the same script to, let's say, CEDA cluster. I'm going to copy it, uh, so I'm copying, in, in this case, uh, to a folder called TMP in my scratch space. And then uh, on the cluster, I CD into that uh, folder. And uh, one thing that you have to change is the path, so the path of the uh, data file. Uh, so instead of a local path, it's going to be a remote file. So scratch rasm of TMP in my case. And then I simply load the Paraview off screen 55.2 module and I run the script. I This will create 90 images on CEDA. Uh, FFmpeg command is installed on CEDA, so you just use it locally. That will create a file remote volume.mpeg4 on CEDA that you can download and watch on on, on your machine, on your laptop. So in this case, we're doing rendering on the login node and uh, the, this visualization is not very large, so you can actually do it on the login node. But for anything more intensive, please uh, please script it as a bad job and it's really, really easy to do using the example I showed you in one of the previous slides. So uh, actually, yes, yeah, so he, here's the entire script on, uh, yeah, so this single slide actually shows you the whole thing. So here's the complete version of the same script at the top. Uh, then the, um, uh, so that's the Python code. Then next I have uh, the Sloom batch submission uh, script, right? So I'm asking for, in this case, I'm not running it in serial because Matplotlib is not parallel. I'm asking for a single core, five uh, minutes, uh, 3,600 megabytes, and I load the par uh, Python, uh, sorry, I load uh, Paraview off screen. 5.5.2 uh, module, and then I run the script. And then uh, after the, uh, so I submit the script with as batch, and then get 90 images. I simply, on the login node, simply merge them into a movie, then download the movie to my laptop. So you may ask, how is this possible when we don't have any GPUs at all on the, let's say, on a login node or on a regular compute node? Well, the answer is Paraview is perfectly, uh, works perfectly well on uh, a GPU-less um, machine. So what it will do, it will actually render on a CPU. And there are actually multiple ways of doing this instead of Paraview. So the module Paraview off-screen 552 module on Sierra, Gram, Beluga, et cetera, 
was compiled with OS Mesa off screen rendering. So that means that uh, things that normally run on a GPU card will run in software and they will be just as fast, well, almost as fast as, uh, as on IGBU. So this is different from another um, software rendering library, uh, ray tracing library that is called uh, Osprey. So that's a very popular, really, really fast, really good library from Intel open source library that's let you do ray tracing on a CPU. So you can also enable Osprey uh, inside of Paraview, but that's a different topic, so not for, for this, uh, for this um, webinar. And we'll talk very briefly about GPU rendering uh, later on in a few slides. So that's, uh, I just showed you the visualization workflow if you have a small visualization that you can do on your laptop and you can debug it entirely on your laptop, right? So you debug it locally, create the script locally, and then you copy the script to CETA, RAM, etc., and you run it remotely. So what if you want to do very large scale visualization where you just cannot in principle debug a script on a laptop? Well, you can use client server to debug the script on, on the cluster. So here's my demo. I will actually try to run this demo, but uh, we have only 15 minutes left and I'm not sure if CETA cluster will uh, cooperate with me if I can start the, the interactive job start, starts right away. But let me just try, uh, try try to do this. And if it doesn't work, I'll just um, uh, show you the slides. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a visualization of the default data set from this uh, visualized uh, this computation. As I mentioned, it's a very large safety data set. So um, it's a fluid dynamics uh, simulation of airflow around uh, a turbine blade. Uh, so airfoil and uh, the entire data set is almost one terabyte in size five hydronomical variables. The simulation was done of 512 cores. There are 86 time steps. And if you try to load it into Paraview, you will uh, discover that you'll need a lot of memory. So if you have a very large memory server, let's say 256 gigabyte memory server, you will see that just to visualize a single time step and a single variable, you'll need actually around 200 gigabytes of memory. So obviously you cannot do that very easily on a laptop, but fortunately you can do this rendering in parallel on, on CETA and, and other clusters. So the image above is actually part of, uh, so it's linked from the visualized, um, uh, it's, it's on, you can find it on uh, the visualized, this website uh, that is linked at the top uh, in one of the posts there. And this particular image is part of an animation that was actually done. So the animation 86 time steps, it was done on 128 cores on CETA, CPU cores, and it took 17 minutes. So as you can see, this is fairly intensive rendering. So on the cluster, what we'll do is we'll now uh, uh, try to start a client server, um, a client server Paraview on 120, using 128 cores on, on CETA. So what I'm gonna do is I will log into CETA cluster from my laptop. And uh, so demo command is just a uh, shorthand for me to, uh, so that I can copy and paste these, these guys. So I don't have to actually uh, type them from, uh, from scratch. So I'm gonna start an interactive job. So that's the interactive petition on CEDA. I'll ask for one hour, uh, 128 cores, so MPI parallel job, and 300, uh, sorry, 3,600 megabytes of memory per core. And uh, let's just wait uh, a little bit and see if the job starts. I have no idea how busy the interactive petition is now. So let's see if it works, great. And if it doesn't, then I'll just switch to back to my slides. Okay, so while it's waiting, uh, what you can do is, so you start an interactive job on 128 cores, uh, then once the job starts, actually it started, I think. Yep, excellent, it started. Now what I can do is I'm gonna load the Paraview off screen module and it's important to load this off screen module because it has CPU based rendering, uh, rendering uh, baked into this Paraview. And then I'm gonna start the Paraview server on these 128 cores inside the job. And then as you can see, the main node, uh, so it, it's CETA 768 and it's actually started this, uh, the Paraview server. So it says accepting, so it's waiting for incoming uh, client connection uh, on this um, compute node of CETA on this port. So what I need to do is memorize this, uh, this number 768 and then I'm gonna uh, copy these commands from, from, the, um, uh, from the presentation. So on my laptop in another window, I'm gonna organize SSH port forwarding. So that was 768, 768, and I'm gonna connect to CETA, uh, forwarding, so doing SSH port forwarding from this port on my laptop to this port on this node of CETA. Great. 
And then I'm going to start uh, Paraview 5.5 on my laptop. And the reason I need to use 5.5 but not 5.7 is because you have to have the same major, uh, to, to match the, the uh, same major version of Paraview as uh, the, uh, the server on, on CETA. So allow. OK, great. And then I'm going to say connect. And uh, see where it says accepting connection. When I click connect, it's going to say client connected. Okay, so great. Now we have client server connection, and then I'm going to start the trace. I'm going to start trace. I uh, just show all properties. Uh, say okay, and then I will attempt to load the data set. So I'm going to go to file open, and then I'll navigate the data set. So I'll open case foam file. I'll need to make sure that it's the composed case. Say apply. And now we are reading data set in parallel. So data set is very large. So single time step plus mesh is several hundred, it's about a couple hundred gigabytes. So it's reading this in parallel 120 day course and it takes only a fraction of a minute as you can see from the progress bar. Okay, so once data set is loaded, what we're gonna do next is I'm gonna create a variable called, uh, so I'll use the calculator filter. I'm going to create a variable called speed. And then for speed, I'm going to use the magnitude of the velocity vector. OK. So click apply and then done. And then next, what I'm going to do is uh, bring an ISO counter. And I'm going to counter by, so an ISO surface of constant speed at this value. And then I'll say apply. Now is doing all this processing and rendering on the cluster in parallel. Okay, so here is my ISO surface. As you can see, it's much smaller than the original data set. Uh, well, ge geometrically smaller. Uh, here we go. And here we see turbulence. So next what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna call it, oops, sorry, zoom in a different direction. I'm gonna call it by the vertical component of the uh, vorticity vector, okay, and then I'm going to switch to a different color map. So I'm going to use this color map, rainbow desaturated, and then I'm going to save this image. So I'm going to save file, save screenshot, and uh, so this is uh, the local file system. So I'll go to this directory. I'm just going to say, I don't know, AAA dot png and just some file name. So that is saving to the local file system. So the image saved. Okay, it actually asks me for uh, image size, etc. And then I go to tools, stop trace. And now this gives me the Python code behind what I just did in the GUI. Right? So there's, again, a lot of stuff. It's actually a very lengthy code because I did quite a lot of things. So instead of uh, saving this, I already cleaned it. Uh, and I included the compact version of this uh, script inside uh, the zip download file. So that's the entire script. And as you can see, what it does is it, very easy to understand. So here I also make sure that you have the right paths uh, for the for, for the CEDA file system. Here I am reading the data uh, as the compose key. So that's just the way it was written from the simulation. I'm uh, loading only, uh, so uh, there, there are several different partitions inside the data set. I'm reading the three-dimensional internal mesh. I'm reading only the, uh, the uh, three-dimensional velocity vector and the vorticity vector. So these are the only two variables that I will need, uh, setting the camera, then applying the calculator filter to compute speed, which is magnitude of the velocity vector, then doing contour of, uh, so either surface of speed at this value, and then uh, setting, so setting uh, some properties of these contours. Uh, and uh, uh, modifying, so setting the transfer function and basically the color map and then saving the image, right? So uh, now you can actually run it. So here I debugged uh, this script uh, completely in client server using the large, the huge data set uh, on CEDA. So one terabyte data set. And then as you can see, it's fairly easy to uh, debug it. Well, debugging part I didn't show, but I showed you how to create the script uh, from scratch. And then you copy the script to uh, the cluster and then uh, you simply 
Uh, you simply run it as, uh, as a, either a bad job or as a script inside an interactive job. So for example, inside the interactive job, when you do these, um, this rendering, uh, we already have interactive job running right now. So actually, let me show this. Uh, I'm going to close, uh, close uh, this prior view. And I'm going to go back to the shell on my, so you see it's exited the previous server, but I'm still running my 128 core interactive job. And here is my uh, script flow.py, and it's reading this data, and then it's uh, saving the file airflow.png. Right? So uh, let's just run the script. Uh, to run the script inside the job, I need to type npi, basically uh, this thing. I'm going to copy and paste this. So uh, npi run on 128 processes uh, using PV batch from 5.5 pair view off screen rendering and pass the script. And now it's doing um, off screen rendering without opening any windows, without any interactivity, using 128 cores uh, inside the interactive job, the same interactive job. Okay, and it actually gives me some warnings. Not sure what those could not determine array range. Oh, that's interesting. I ran it before and it did not. Let's see. Yeah, I'll just pull. Scratch. Yeah, I'm not sure what the problem is, but I ran it before and it ran before, so I'll need to debug. Let's see if it actually created if it, those were just warnings or errors. So let's see if oh, it actually worked. No, it worked. Those were, no, sorry, it didn't work. The file is there, but it's way too small, only six kilobytes. So it didn't work, so I'll have to debug it further, but I ran the script yesterday and it worked perfectly, so I'm not sure what, what the problem now is, but I'm sure it's something really trivial. Okay, so once you're happy with the result, you can actually uh, submit uh, this, uh, the script as a batch interactive job, right? So using as batch, asking for 128 cores, and, and here you go. Um, so let's see, we have only a few minutes left. Uh, let me just skip a few slides. So uh, GPU rendering. Uh, you can actually do rendering not on, on CPUs, but on GPUs in the cluster. And this is actually fairly easy to do. So you don't have to modify your script. What you need to do is, so uh, in the past, uh, rendering on GPUs required X11 in Unix. Uh, so X11 and Windows, X11 Windows, so basically the windowing system was needed so that a GPU knew where it had to uh, create, uh, well, to create surfaces and, and do porting onto which surfaces and, and, and which windows. So you had to have X11 running at the same time. So fortunately, things changed a few years ago. So now there is a component of the NVIDIA driver called EGL, stands for Embedded Graphics Library, that actually lets you uh, do uh, rendering on the GPU without X11. So it will create the rendering context and the surfaces, so the windows and the surfaces onto which to plot entirely uh, entirely without a window and system. So it will use just that, sub, uh, well, that part of the NVIDIA driver. And we have a specially uh, compiled version of, uh, of uh, Paraview on the cluster. So the latest one uh, that supports this is Paraview Offscreen GPU 5.4.1. And then you can use it in batch mode. You can use it in, 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 in client server mode. And it will do rendering right on, on GPUs. So the only thing is you need to request GPUs. So when you submit either your interactive job or your batch job, you have to pass the option, the flag, basically how many GPUs per node you're asking for. Right? And then it should work. So should is an important uh, word here. So uh, the question is, do you really want to uh, do uh, GPU rendering as opposed to CPU rendering? So uh, traditional dance was yes, because uh, CPU rendering libraries were really bad in the past, but things have changed in the past five years or so. So uh, OS Mesa, so the default off-screen um, uh, off uh, CPU-based rendering library, Mesa or OS Mesa, uh, was uh, updated um, in the past few years, was entirely rewritten in the past few years, and it's actually now really fast. So CPU-based rendering is quite fast, and especially it's nice when you already have a large uh, job where you have using a lot of cores just to feed your, uh, your data set into memory. Uh, on the cluster, you already have a lot of uh, CPU cores available to you. So these same CPU cores can be used for rendering. So that is really nice. And I find in practice, in most cases, when you uh, try to visualize very large data sets, you actually don't have and don't want to do uh, GPU rendering because rendering on CPUs will be as fast or faster uh, given that you have so many CPUs already. So sometimes when you're trying to do GPU rendering, you will see an error here at the bottom that says only EGL 1.4 and greater allows OpenGL 
uh, as client API. And we actually don't know what the error is, so it's an issue back with the NVIDIA driver. And uh, so we try updating the NVIDIA driver to the latest one, and that did not fix the problem. So what happens, uh, and you don't see this error often, but you will see sometimes if you try to do GPU rendering, is uh, GPU is stuck in a strange state, and the only solution we found is uh, the node has to be rebooted. But it's actually quite difficult because nodes are shared between uh, well, among multiple users, and we cannot just reboot and know if you know somebody else is is running job there. So, uh, for this reason, and also for the other reasons mentioned on this slide, I highly, highly recommend to start with uh, CPU-based rendering, because uh, you will actually uh, achieve much well, your beautiful create your beautiful visualization much faster than with uh, GPU rendering. So uh, another question uh, that I promised to answer in the abstract, how many GPUs um, or CPUs uh, I need. So what I suggest here is start with CPU-based CPU -based rendering and uh, start with uh, the data set size. So in this case, we have a CFD simulation that we know that if you load uh, a single time step, single variable into memory, it'll take about 200 gigabytes, simply because it's unstructured mesh and that mesh takes a lot of, a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of um, space memory. So uh, you, if you want to visualize it on a cluster, on a cluster based node uh, on usual petitions, uh, both on seed and gram, each node has um, 32 cores and 128 gigabytes. So that's roughly four gigabytes of memory per core. So out of these four gigabytes, roughly three and a half gigabytes are good for, for, uh, well, for anything, anything you, you want to use them for. And roughly half a gigabyte is taken by uh, the operating system, you know, MPI buffers, all the system level stuff that is running there. So you have three half, three, 3.5 gigabytes of memory per core. And then uh, just divide 200 gigabytes per, you know, by 3.5, you get 58 cores. So that means that you also need to account for you know, filters, MPI buffers, a little bit of data processing. So that means that in, a, in order to do anything with this data set, basically to load it, you'll need uh, roughly 64 cores on pseudogram or other clusters. But if you want to apply any processing, any, any complex or expensive filters, then I highly recommend using 128 cores. So that's why I use 128 cores, asking for 3,600 megabytes of memory uh, per core. And then, as you can see, I could actually uh, do it in live in, in the demo uh, just a few minutes ago. So visit, I, I see we ran out of time. Uh, visit, uh, things are uh, conceptually similar in visit, but the GUI and the way you do things are very different. Uh, so uh, the two workflows that I show that I sh uh, showed to you, uh, debugging a small visualization locally in your laptop and then copying the script and then running it, uh, as a batch job on the cluster. So that's workflow number one. And then workflow number two, uh, working in client server and uh, debugging remote visualization, saving as a local, saving it as a local script and then uh, editing it, so simplifying it and then copying it to the cluster and then running it as a bad job. So those things are exactly the same thing. The details differ. So the, the way you run scripts and the way you use the recording tools and you know use filters, they're called operators and visits. So all details are different, but conceptually things are similar. So if you want to uh, learn more, I actually three years ago, I did a webinar on scripting and uh, advanced visualization, remote visualization visit. So it's linked from, uh, from our visualization page uh, from this slide. And you can watch that webinar and it'll give you, give you a lot more details. So I think I will end here. Uh, here's my summary. As you can see, there is quite a lot of material and quite a lot of things I didn't cover in details. But again, if you're curious about details, uh, please go to the website that I mentioned previously. So that we have this training materials page that is linked several times in, in the previous slides. And also if you want a, uh, let's say full day visualization uh, workshop using either Paraview or Visit, we, we teach both, uh, please let me know. And I'm happy to travel to other universities in West Grid, so the four Western provinces from British Columbia to Manitoba and give full day workshops on, on Paraview or Visit or anything uh, visualization related. So on that note, thank you very much. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to either enter them into the chat window or unmute yourself. Okay, if, okay, there's a question. Is the same can be done with VMD for MD simulations? Yes, absolutely. So with VMD, you can actually script your visualization workflow and run it from a command line. So yes. Um, I looked only briefly at it, so I don't really have any, any demos or any training materials for this, but the answer is yes, absolutely. You can script your VMD visualization and you can, re, you can sorry, run it uh, using Python script in VMD completely off screen without opening any windows. 
do you have experience with visualizing in virtual reality in Paraview? No, not really. I don't have any virtual reality hardware. So things like, uh, well, either using um, uh, head-mounted displays or uh, things like caves and, you know, uh, uh, caves are rooms with uh, the walls uh, covered entirely by screens and where you have this virtual environment. So not really. So I did play a number of years ago, I did with Paraview visualization on a, on a uh, stereoscopic uh, projector and it worked really well, uh, but you had to use special glasses and that's all I can say. So Paraview, Paraview fully supports um, head-mounted displays, so things like Oculus, Oculus Rift and HTC Vive, but you have to, comp to compile them uh, separately. So it's not the default compilation of Paraview, but there is an option to compile Paraview to support these, um, these hardware. So unfortunately, I don't have any, um, any, uh, any uh, virtual uh, reality, uh, any virtual reality hardware in my office, and I cannot play with it, but I know, yes, it can be done. Okay, uh, any other questions? If not, then thank you very much for your attention, and feel free to send me an email if you have any follow-up questions. Thanks, everybody.